please remember to leave a like, a comment, share the video about, and if you haven't already, subscribe. Thank you. Well, isn't this just fantastic? Captain's Log, Supplemental. What's rarer than a celebrity that doesn't break the law? Apparently it's somebody working within the prison system ending up in one of our very own ISO cubes. About that. Welcome everyone to the Halls of Injustice. Today we welcome inmates number 157 to the ISO cubes. Now before we actually get into inmates number 157, who they are, the crime, the trial, the sentence, I want to provide an update to something we've covered before concerning Gary Glitter. Now Gary Glitter is a fascinating person. They've done their time and now they're free. Not like Dobby, but I think many people would wish a Dobby-esque ending to Gary Glitter, just unmarked. Something well known about Gary Glitter is he went on a global tour, banging anything that was within his age range. In doing so, he sired a young lad called Gary Jr. Not a joke. His son, Gary Pantoja Sosa, has recently admitted he's been talking to his father on the phone and hopes to settle in the United Kingdom. Currently residing in Gran Canaria, where he works as a tattoo artist, he has said, I've never met him in person because that has never been possible, but we speak on the phone all the time. Whenever I speak to him, he's in good spirits. He has lots of energy and is always very positive. I never get the impression that he's depressed. I hope we will get to meet each other finally. My dream is that we will live in the same country. I don't know how we will make that happen, but there's something else to this. Um, he doesn't believe his dad's guilty of any of the crimes he was convicted of. Just thought I'd share that. The delusion is strong. So let us now talk a bit about inmates number 157, aka Cherie Spencer. And as Cherie Spencer is all too familiar with the Halls of Injustice, the ISO cubes, very intimate detailed knowledge of the correctional facilities, this one should be interesting. Inmates number 157, aka Cherie Spencer, is a 45-year-old mother of three from Bubwith, East Yorkshire. Cherie Spencer worked as a prison reform boss, more notably the highest levels for Her Majesty's Prison and Probation Service, bragging at one point that she even had the ear of Boris Johnson, who was at the time Prime Minister. This all being confirmed by a former friend of hers who said she would brag about being only two down from the Prime Minister in her field and have meetings with Boris Johnson, who she spoke of as though he were a friend. One of her main focuses was investigating the effect of custodial sentences on the family, which by the way will be spoken with no level of irony, although we can consider it for this video a form of foreshadowing. Being the project manager in a department's directorate of strategy and performance, her position was highly respected, coveted. She was thought of in high regard, which is why she was involved in so many key meetings with politicians. So it's no surprise to anyone really that when you're in such a position, in such a respected position, when you think of yourself so highly, you develop a sense of self-importance beyond that of what your occupation is, an ego. That ego would manifest frustrations. These frustrations would be doled out on one person. And that is where we're going to go next. The Crimes of Cherie Spencer. The nature of the crimes committed by Cherie Spencer were conducted, committed, enacted on Richard Spencer, with whom she started dating in 2000. Within months of it, in fact, whether she was drunk or sober, her violent rages would manifest. And that although Richard Spencer was bigger and physically stronger, he did not fight back when she began to attack. Going so far as to later on admit, he became almost immune to the physical abuse she meted out, even though she would cause him immense pain by sinking her teeth into him. The crimes ended, the reign of domestic terror ended in June 2021, when the police were called to the family home by a concerned welfare worker. At that point, he had given nothing away, but finally managed to show what he had endured for so long. Because he was smart, he took opportunities when they arose over 20 years to record, picture, and then find a way to hide it. Not on a memory stick, not under the couch on a DVD or a 
tape disc or whatever it is people hide stuff on these days. No, he actually hid it somewhere a little bit smarter. He hid it in his emails. He would email it to himself, pictures of his face having been pummeled, videos and audio of the abuse. And then he would delete the message being sent from his phone. So the email always existed, but she had no way of knowing he was keeping a record of it for over 20 years. In total, she subjected him to over a hundred physically, mentally, emotionally abusive episodes. And I want to list just a few of these rather horrendous incidents. On one occasion, she defecated on a floor and ordered her husband to clean it up. On another, she beat him with a wine bottle so hard that she had permanently disfigured his ear. During those same wine fueled tirades, she would verbally abuse him, cause bruises and scratches, that he would then need to cover up with makeup before he then went outside. He had managed to hand over to the police when they became involved 43 images of his bruised face that were taken on different dates following the assaults, along with dozens of video and audio recordings he had managed to make. Now I am certain many of you are now going to say, why didn't he fight back or restrain her? He didn't fight back because he's a man and he knows he can't. The second, he did actually restrain her, but actually it made it worse because she didn't calm down. With him admitting, I became increasingly hardened to the physical attacks, and while I am physically bigger and stronger, so I could restrain her, I could only hold her for so long, and when the time came to let go, she would be even angrier, and the injuries she would inflict afterwards were always worse. Now to go back to the wine bottle incident, because there's more to it, this caused his ear to swell. He needed hospital treatment, but she instead looked up YouTube videos on how to drain blood from the ear by puncturing it with a knife. Richard refused what she told him, and she said that if he used his name at the hospital, she would stop him coming back into the family home. Being there for his three children was the most important thing to him. Apparently there was no way out for him at this time, where he could also safely remove the children from this situation as well. So she ordered him to use her brother's name and he did as he was told. The crimes that she committed are domestic abuse, battery, actual bodily harm. Manipulative and coercive behavior is the section of domestic violence law I want to talk about before we go to the trial of Cherie Spencer. In 2012, the UK government altered the domestic violence law to include coercive and manipulative behavior. The definition reads as follows. Coercive behavior is an act or a pattern of acts of assaults, threats, humiliation, and intimidation, or other abuse that is used to harm, punish, or frighten their victim. Controlling behavior is a range of acts designed to make a person subordinate and or dependent by isolating them from sources of support, exploiting their resources and capacities for personal gain, depriving them of the means needed for independence, resistance and escape and regulating their everyday behavior. Since 2012 when this was introduced, yeah, the number of female perpetrators of DV has skyrocketed. It's getting closer and closer to 50-50. Not that any percentage of any kind of DV is remotely acceptable. And when you break that down further into sexuality-based relationships, yeah, women don't look any better. In 2015, it was also introduced to the Serious Crime Act under controlling or coercive behavior in an intimate or family relationship. The new offense, which does not have retrospective effect, came into force on the 29th of December 2015. An offense is committed by A if A repeatedly or continuously engages in behavior towards another person, B that he is controlling or coercive, and at time of the behavior, A and B are personally connected, and the behavior has a serious effect on B and A knows or ought to know that the behavior will have a serious effect on B. How they define how they're connected, pretty self-explanatory. Now there are two ways it can be proved that A's behavior has a serious effect on B. If it causes B to fear on at least two occasions that violence will be used against them, or if it causes B serious alarm or distress, which has a substantial adverse effect on their day-to-day -day activities. If found guilty on a number of these charges, you can face five years in prison. You can be fined, or you can receive both. So on to the trial. When it went to trial, Richard Pratt KC had said that there was little he could do to mitigate against Cherie Spencer's appalling treatment of her husband, whilst also acknowledging the irony in her professional accomplishments. 
He said it was almost impossible to recognize her professional person as the same woman who subjected her husband to the shocking and distressing attacks. Being quoted as saying, It is perhaps particularly ironic that one of the projects she had been working on has been dealing with the effects of custodial sentences on the family. That is an irony, but what is important and significant is that she continued to work and has an excellent work reputation and record. He also pointed to the fact that she suffered bouts of depression and anxiety throughout her life, and that she had wrongly sought to self-medicate by drinking alcohol. On some days where this anxiety and depression got so bad, she would drink as much as three bottles of wine. When Richard Spencer took to the stand a lot of what I've already covered, he said in the courtroom, but I'm gonna add a little more of what he'd also said. The abuse was hidden from the outside world, including friends and family. Cherie manipulated me into believing that I was responsible and a willing participant in the abuse. She remorselessly proclaimed that I deserved to be punished, and that it was a justifiable consequence of me disappointing her in some way. Little by little, I lost my independence and willpower, and just accepted that that was how my life was going to be. I complied with Cherie's demands and she controlled most aspects of my everyday life, including things like what activities I could participate in and when, which room I could sleep in, and even which toilet I could use. Gradually, I became isolated from family and friends, and was left deep in debt, causing me to feel trapped. Cherie Spencer, aka inmates number 157, was found guilty. Oh, she was found guilty. Even her defense knew she was guilty. While smirking in the dock, the judge delivered a statement, and of course her sentence, which we'll get to after the statement. In one of these recordings, it is clear you had defecated on the floor. Your husband can be heard scrubbing while you are saying to him, I made you do that. All I asked you to do was go to the shop. I watched as you spat in his face time and time again and called him bitch, tiny cock, and skank, and insulted members of his family. You whispered in his face in the most sinister way, shouted demands and instructions at him, get the effing chicken on, get to the effing shop, and warning him, you will learn. By your actions, you intended to humiliate or degrade Richard, and you have caused him significant psychological harm. Richard Spencer was a vulnerable victim, isolated from his family and trapped financially. Cherie Spencer by this point had admitted to coercive and controlling behavior, along with three counts of assault occasioning actual bodily harm. The charges could only cover a five-year period dating from the time the law on controlling and coercive behavior was passed in late 2015. So everything before, 15 years worth, could not be added. Judge Rayfield though took into account her persistent behavior towards her husband because it cast light on his vulnerability as her victim. So took this very seriously and sentenced inmate 157 to four years in prison, along with an indefinite restraining order preventing her from ever contacting Richard Spencer ever again. Now, while she may have grinned while being led from the dock to serve her time in prison, guaranteed she will never see Richard Spencer ever again, the harm done to him is severe. Any victim of DV should never be afraid to speak up and how she played him for 20 years to beat him down and defeat him. So she had absolute control over everything in her life as a crap coping mechanism for her own inadequacies. Really does a fantastic job explaining and demonstrating how an ego can absolutely control you to the point that you will harm everything around you so you look strong, when in reality, you are by definition the weakest link in your family.